Greetings, and welcome to All Things Physics, where we take an in-depth look at the world through the eyes of a physicist. Today I want to discuss a phenomenon that plays a key role in the game of pool. Check it out! If you've ever played pool, you know that it's a game that involves a lot of physics. You clearly need to understand collisions and angles, but you also need to have a delicate touch. What you may not realize is that to become a true expert requires the ability to put spin, or English, on the cue ball. By adding just the right amount of English, an expert can leave the cue ball pretty much anywhere on the table they want, allowing them to set up the next shot to be as easy as possible. To get a sense of what's happening here, let's take a slow motion look at a few specific shots. In what's referred to as a draw shot, we strike the cue ball below center, imparting backspin in the process. Notice how the cue ball maintains this backspin after the collision, eventually moving back in the direction it came from. If we instead strike the cue ball right in the center, the result is a stun shot. Notice how very little spin is imparted to the cue ball now, which stops dead in its tracks after the collision. A follow shot is accomplished by striking the cue ball above center, imparting topspin in the process. Once again, the cue ball maintains this spin after the collision and eventually follows after the ball that was just hit. Personally, I find it fascinating to see how spin on the cue ball gets transferred into translational motion. And that's exactly what I want to talk about today. In this video, we're going to analyze the motion of a rolling object that slips against the ground. A situation like this. To keep things simple, we'll consider a one-dimensional situation in which the object can only translate left or right, and can only rotate about an axis perpendicular to the screen. We'll also assume a perfectly rigid object, so that there's a single point of contact between the object and the table. This assumption results in there being no rolling resistance, which means an object that rolls without slipping will roll forever. Although this is clearly an idealization, it's actually a pretty good assumption for hard surfaces, as we can verify by rolling this object along the table. Even though we know it won't roll forever, it doesn't appear to slow down at all. <laughs> Lastly, before getting into the details, recall that an object that rolls without slipping is governed by a mathematical constraint between the translational and rotational speeds. If this constraint equation is at all puzzling to you, I recommend you press pause and watch the video titled A Detailed Look at a Rolling Wheel before continuing. In this video, we're going to analyze what happens when an object is launched with arbitrary translational and rotational velocities on a flat surface in the presence of friction. We'll assume the object has mass m and radius r, and for convenience, we'll write the rotational inertia about the center of mass in terms of a numerical parameter we'll call beta that lies between 0 and 1. A hoop, for example, has beta equal 1, while a disk and a sphere have values 1 half and 2 fifths, respectively. We begin with a free body diagram. As always, the gravitational force acts at the center of mass, has magnitude mg, and points toward the center of Earth. The table gives rise to two forces, a normal force, acting perpendicular to the surface, and a friction force that acts parallel to the surface. Both of these forces act at the point of contact between the object and the table. The direction of the friction force turns out to be a little tricky to determine in general, as it depends on both the translational and rotational velocities. We'll return to this issue in a moment. For now, let's just focus on the vertical direction. If we take the x-axis pointing right and the y-axis pointing down, then the z-axis points into the screen. Using this coordinate system, the gravitational force points in the positive y direction, while the normal force points in the negative y direction. Substituting into Newton's second law, and noting that there's no motion in the y direction, 
we can immediately determine that the magnitude of the normal force is equal to the weight of the object. Let's now return to the friction force. As noted earlier, friction only acts when the object slides against the table, and as long as we know the coefficient of friction, we can calculate its magnitude. To find its direction, we need to determine whether the point on the object in contact with the ground slides to the right or to the left, as the friction force will oppose this motion. Of course, the point in contact with the ground will move as a result of both translational and rotational motion. To determine the direction of the friction force in the general case, we consider these motions separately. First, suppose the object has some given translational velocity. In this case, every point on the object, including the point at the bottom, will have the same velocity. Thus, the velocity of the point that's in contact with the ground is simply equal to the translational velocity of the object. Similarly, suppose the object rotates about the z-axis with a given angular velocity. In this case, each point on the object will circle around the center of the object with a speed that's proportional to its distance from the center. But notice that a negative rotational velocity causes the bottom of the object to move in the positive x direction, while a positive rotational velocity causes it to move in the negative x direction. This observation allows us to determine an expression for the velocity of the point at the bottom of the object due solely to rotational motion. Combining these velocities gives the velocity of the point at the bottom of the object when undergoing both translational and rotational motion. Now, our goal is to determine the friction force, which opposes the direction of motion. To get this direction, we divide the velocity by its magnitude which, in one dimension, can be written with the help of the signum or sine, S-I-G-N, function. The sine function simply returns the sine of its argument, plus one if the argument is positive, minus one if the argument is negative, and zero if the argument happens to be zero. Finally, now that we know the direction of motion, we can write down an expression for the friction force. Substituting this force into Newton's second law, we arrive at an equation that appears to depend on the translational and rotational velocities. But remember that the sine function is either positive 1, negative 1, or 0. Therefore, as long as the object slides against the ground, there are only two possibilities to consider. A constant friction force that's either positive or negative. The analysis is essentially identical for these two situations, so we'll consider only one. We'll assume the object is thrown with a positive translational velocity and a negative rotational velocity. This is the situation for an object thrown with backspin. In this case, the velocity of the point at the bottom of the object is positive, resulting in a negative friction force and a constant negative acceleration. Because the acceleration is constant, we can make use of one of the kinematics equations to calculate the object's translational velocity as a function of time. This result tells us that as long as the disk continues to slide against the ground, the translational velocity will decrease linearly with time. However, we know from experience that at some point the object will stop sliding, which means the friction force will disappear and the object will begin rolling without slipping. To determine precisely when this transition occurs requires that we analyze the object's rotational motion. Now, Newton's second law for rotational motion must be handled carefully. For non-static situations, it's usually easiest to choose the center of mass as the rotation axis. In this particular case, there's three forces acting. But notice that both the gravitational force and the normal force are aligned with the center of mass. The result is that neither of these forces exerts a torque about the object's center. Therefore, we only need to determine the torque exerted by friction. Recall that the torque is given by a cross product with a magnitude that depends on the force magnitude and the moment arm, 
and a direction given by the right-hand rule. For the specific case we're considering here, the right-hand rule results in a torque that points into the screen, in the positive Z direction. Substituting this torque into the rotational version of Newton's second law then leads to a constant rotational acceleration. Once again, the fact that the rotational acceleration is constant allows us to use one of the kinematic equations to determine the rotational velocity as a function of time. At this point, it's a good idea to pause and gather our thoughts. Recall that we assumed the point at the bottom of the object initially had a positive velocity, resulting in a negative friction force. Applying Newton's laws then resulted in a decreasing translational velocity and an increasing rotational velocity, both of which lead to a decrease in the velocity of the point at the bottom of the object. This velocity will continue to decrease until it reaches zero, at which point the friction force disappears and the object begins moving with a constant velocity as it rolls without slipping. Thus, our solutions for the translational and rotational velocities are only valid before the object begins rolling without slipping, a time we refer to as the no-slip time. To determine the no-slip time, we apply the rolling without slipping constraint to our solutions for the translational and rotational velocities. After a bit of algebra, we arrive at a solution that seems complicated and unenlightening. However, if we rewrite the denominator in terms of the translational and rotational accelerations, then we see that the no-slip time is equal to the initial velocity of the point at the bottom of the object divided by its acceleration. This ratio is exactly what one would expect for the time it takes an object to reach zero velocity when the acceleration is constant. Substituting the no-slip time back into our expressions for the translational and rotational velocities, we can then determine the motion of the object once it begins rolling without slipping. Interestingly, notice that the final velocity does not depend on the coefficient of friction. In other words, the same initial conditions lead to the same final velocity regardless of whether the object is sliding on a wooden table or on ice. This surprising result is a consequence of the fact that although the friction force, and therefore the acceleration, is proportional to the coefficient of friction, the no-slip time turns out to be inversely proportional to the friction coefficient. Therefore, a larger friction force is offset by acting for a proportionally smaller time. At this point, you might be wondering how all this relates to reality. So let's look at a side-by-side -side comparison of an actual sliding wheel and the solution we just found. As you can see here, the simulated motion compares remarkably well to the real world. Now that we have the solution, the last thing I'd like to discuss is the situation where the object's final velocity is zero. To find the answer, all we have to do is set the final velocity equal to zero. The expression we end up with provides a constraint between the initial translational and rotational velocities. An object thrown with initial conditions that satisfy this constraint will slide to a perfect standstill. Before finishing this video, let's see if we can apply what we've learned to the real world by throwing this disk so that it slides to a stop. We can use the initial condition constraint equation we just derived to determine the relationship between the translational and rotational velocities for a disk if we substitute in the value beta equals one half. Unfortunately, this doesn't really help us because there's no simple way to accurately adjust the velocities when you're throwing it by hand. It really just comes down to trial and error and perhaps a little luck. Let's see how we do. By the way, this is a fun challenge, so I encourage you to try it at home. But fair warning, it's harder than it looks.
<laughs> That's the one. And with that, I'll bring this video to a close. I'm David Jackson. I'll see you next time on All Things Physics.